talking about the perfect gift and the fact that our God is a gift giver. This month we've been talking about the fact that during Christmas time it seems to be all about the gifts, but that's okay because our God is the greatest gift giver who's ever existed. And the truth is that he has given us some of the greatest gifts we could possibly imagine. We have received from him the gift of Jesus Christ, his only begotten son that has given us heaven and eternal life. He's given us the gift of the world and creation and the life to live it. And this morning I want to talk about a third gift, and it's an interesting gift because it is a letter to us, a love letter that God has wrote, written to us. Uh, when Elizabeth Taylor died, her only request was that she be buried with her most prized possession, and that was a love letter that had been written to her by her last husband, Richard Burton, uh, who had died 27 years before. She'd kept it, and, and it was her most prized possession. Isn't it amazing how something that someone writes, a letter, can be such a precious gift to us? Well, God has written us a love letter. He's given us his holy word, and it speaks to us about who he is and who we are. And it answers the most important questions in life, questions like, what is God's name? Who is this God that we worship? Of all the gods that people say exist, which one is the true God? Which one is real? And does he know my name? Uh, does he know me as an individual? Can I have a relationship with this God of the universe? And if so, how? Does he have a plan and a purpose for me and for my life? Is there life after death? Can I spend eternity with God? Is there a, a real standard of right and wrong? What is right? What is wrong? And if God does not tell us these things, we would never know the answer to these questions. And if the scripture gives us the answer to these questions, as I believe it does, it is truly one of the greatest gifts we could have ever received. So this morning, I want to give you a number of reasons for why the Bible is the greatest gift that we have ever received, or one of the greatest gifts. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. And that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your holy, inspired, and inerrant word. We thank you for its gift. We thank you for the fact that you speak to us through it. We ask, Lord, that you help us as we look at the scripture today to value this gift appropriately. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So why is the Bible one of the greatest gifts ever given? Well, the first reason that I want us to note that the Bible is one of the greatest gifts we've ever received is that it is a guide for what we should believe spiritually. What, what we should believe spiritually. This book, this book, you have to make a decision about it. Everyone has to decide what it is. Uh, there are liberals, there are atheists, secular uh, individuals who will tell you that this book is just another book. That is no more inspired than the dictionary or a good novel. But those of us who are believers in Jesus Christ believe differently. We believe that it is literally the word of God, that it is God breathed. Scripture tells us in our, our verse this morning, it says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. That word inspiration literally means exhaled. The breath of God it is from God's breath. God has spoken to us through His Holy Word. This is God's final, complete, sufficient Word. I had a lady I was speaking to one time, and uh, she told me, she said, Well, she didn't believe everything in the Bible. And I said, really? Uh, well, how do, you, how do you do that? And she said, well, I just believe it's inspired in spots. And I said, inspired in spots? Well, if it's inspired in spots, how do you spot the inspired spots from the uninspired spots? And she said, well, I just use my judgment. <laughs> I just use my, my, my judgment. My, my uh, feelings tell me about what is, is true. Here's the problem, folks. <laughs> the Word of God is true. And your feelings and your opinion really doesn't matter. You know, I, I can have an opinion that if I climb up on the steeple and I jump off and flap my arms really hard, that I will be able to fly. But the truth is, I'm going to make a splatter on the pavements. What's going to happen? And, and my opinion doesn't change the truth. 
If this is God's word, it is truth. And all of the Bible, the scripture says, is breathed out by God. That means that every word is written down just as God intended it by the original authors. It is written as God intended it to be. So I hear individuals who say, well, well pastor, yeah, but, but wasn't the Bible written by men? And I hear people say that and they'll, they'll say it as if they're trying to, to impugn the integrity of the Bible in some way. It was just written by men. Well, the Bible anticipates that argument. And it tells us in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. You know what that means? That means that Jeremiah didn't just say one day, you know, I think I'm tired of, of whatever else I'm doing. I'm going to sit down and write a book of the Bible, the longest book of the Bible. I'm just going to do that today. Matthew didn't say, you know, this, this tax collecting gig is getting a little old. I think I'll write a gospel today. Luke didn't say, I, you know, I'm tired of being a physician. I believe I'm going to write, write a, an account of, uh, of uh, the scriptures of what happened to Christ. I believe I'm going to do that. No, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit moved upon them and caused them to write what God intended to write. Peter says here that the Bible originated in the mind of God. It was uh, communicated by the movement of God, and it was recorded by the men of God. It is, therefore, God's word to us. Now, I don't know if you've ever been to the Library of Congress. I've had an opportunity to visit the Library of Congress. It's a remarkable place. It contains over 29 million books, printed over 460 different languages. But I want you to know that 28,999,999 of those books are just the opinions of men. This book is God's word. This book alone is different. This is God's word to you, to me and to you, God's final, sufficient, complete word to us. And that's important because if this book is true, it contains all that you need to believe in order to be saved, to have heaven and eternal life. This is God's final word to us, not just his best word, it's his complete word. You don't need anything else. Folks, the Quran is not God's word. The Book of Mormon is not God's word. The Hindu Vedas are not God's word. You have everything you need for life and eternity with God in this book. Genesis is the beginning of God's word. Revelation is the end of God's word. And everything between the two is the final and complete and sufficient word of God. And since God is its author, it contains spiritual truth and everything that you need to know and believe spiritually. Everything you need to believe spiritually is found in this book. All the guesswork is done. All the heavy lifting has been done for you. God has spoken to us in his word. And for that reason, folks, we need to live. We need to order our lives according to this book. Not only that, we need to order our thoughts according to this book. You know, one of our biggest problems today is that believers look at the world and think the same way as lost people do. We have the same opinions, the same approach to the world as lost people do today. Uh, folks, we should have a different perspective because we spend time in God's Word. We should have a different perspective on things. We should have a different perspective about relationships. We should have a different perspective about our business uh, dealings. We should have a different perspective about other people when we look at other people. I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about. When we look at other people, we tend to drop people in categories, don't we? Well, we tend to look at them, we, we see them as rich and poor and black and white and Republican and Democrat and, you know, whatever. We just, we create these categories and lump people into these categories and that's why we, how we judge them. Folks, you know something? If Jesus walked into this church this morning and he looked around, he would not lump people into the same category we do because Jesus only has two categories, lost and saved. There's a young lady uh, that uh, friended me on Facebook. She's the daughter of a, a man that I knew in, in high school. 
And uh, this girl is, uh, she is messed up. I mean, she is, she is lost as a duck in a hailstorm. And a lot of the stuff she posts on Facebook is just, uh, you, you look at it and you think, wow. <laughs> wow. You know you friended the pastor, right? You know? and, and honestly, a lot of it I could take issue with. And, and I could go in and I could just say, you know, your political beliefs are just ridiculous. And, and you know, all these things that you're involved in are, are satanic. And, you know. <laughs> but, but here's the thing. Those are not the categories that I'm trying to deal with her in. I'm trying to deal with the fact that she's lost and needs Jesus. And so I take every opportunity I can to talk to her about Jesus. And I ignore the other stuff. Because the only category I'm worried about is that she's lost and doesn't know Christ. Folks, we need to start thinking more like Jesus. When we encounter people in our business relationships and, and all that we do, we need to have his perspective. And that perspective comes from immersing ourselves in this book. The Bible's a guide for what we need to believe spiritually, but it's also a guide for how we should behave morally. The Bible is God's final word on what is right and what is wrong. If God is the God of the universe, and this Bible is his final and complete word to us, then it's not hard to know right from wrong. I'm, I'm, I'm going to put this in a way that, that even it's so simple that even a country boy like me can understand, okay? If God says it's right, it's right. If God says it's wrong, it's wrong. Morality is not a matter of public opinion. You don't get to vote on it. I was driving down the road one time listening to the radio, and there's a, a national radio personality, and he made a statement. He's talking about a, a per, per particular issue and he said, this is not a moral issue. It is a moral issue that he was talking about. He said, this is not really a moral issue. He said, because, because honestly, most people think this is okay. <laughs> they drove off the road. Since when did morality become an issue of most people voting on it? Let me give you an example, folks. In 1700s, most people thought slavery was okay. Didn't make it morally right. In the 1930s, most people in Germany thought it was okay to gas Jews. Didn't make it right. Folks, morality is not a matter of opinion or public vote or a popularity contest. If God says it's right, it's right. If God says it's wrong, it's wrong. He is the final and only arbiter of what is and is not right and wrong. It's not up for discussion or for vote. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 in our scripture this morning. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Everything God wants you to do and be is found right here in this book. And the scripture says the Bible is profitable for four things. First of all, he says it's profitable for teaching. It tells us what is right. What is right. In order to do what's right, you have to know what's right. You have, to, you have to teach kids, don't you? You have to teach them what is right and what is wrong, what you, you should do and what you shouldn't do. And, and the Bible teaches us in every major issue we have to deal with. Money, sexuality, greed, ambition, power, heaven, hell. It teaches us right from wrong. And this is a manual for how we are to live in such a way that God will be pleased with us. But the Bible will not only tell you what, what, when you're doing something right, it will also tell you when you're doing something wrong. It tells us what's right. It tells us what's not right. He says here that it is profitable for rebuking, for uh, when we do something wrong. This word carries the idea of correcting someone when their belief or their behavior is incorrect. This book will take you to the, to the woodshed. It will, it will correct things in your life, your flaws, your failures. You know, th this Bible is kind of like a spiritual CAT scan. It, it looks at what you are on the inside. And it begins to rebuke you when it's not what it should be. You know, Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 even compares it to a scalpel. It says here, For the word of God is a living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, 
piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The Holy Spirit says that when you read this book, it, it becomes like a knife and it lays you open. And it reveals what is really inside your heart. If you've got bitterness, it finds it. If you've got anger, it finds it. If you've got lust, it finds it. If you've got greed and selfishness, it will find it, and it will rebuke you. But look at what else it does. Not only does it tell you what is right and what is not right, but it tells you how to get right. It tells you how to get right. Imagine if you were in school, and uh, first day of class, you're in math class, and the first day of class, teacher tells you to get up, walk to the front, and tells you, I want you to solve A squared plus B squared equals C squared. Give me the solution for that. And you're like, well, you didn't teach me how to do this. You can't do that? No. F. Sit down. Next person. You get up and do it. Well, all they're doing is judging you for being wrong. They're never telling you how to get right. Folks, the Bible tells us not only when we're wrong, it tells us how to get right. Right. You know, one of the problems we have as Christians is that you know, that's exactly what we do with so many lost people. We walk up to them and they say, we tell them, your life is wrong. You're living wrong. But we never tell them how to get right. Folks, people need Jesus to get right. Fortunately, the Bible tells us how to be right with God. He says here that the Bible is useful for correction, for correcting us. You know, that word here for correcting, it means to put something back into its correct condition, its right condition. It was used of a, a knocking over a vase. You would correct it by setting it back up again. If someone fell down, you would correct them by getting them back on their feet. That's what it's talking about, getting you back into your correct orientation, setting you right again. The Bible will restore you to the condition that you ought to be in so that you can be right with God. Now, I recognize... Some people will criticize the, the things in the Bible that are negative, and there are a lot of negative things in the Bible. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. There are a lot of thou shalts, but here's the thing, folks. The Bible not only is negative, it's also very positive. Because the Bible not only tells you when you're weak, it tells you how you can get strong. It not only tells you when you're sick, it tells you how you can get strong. Well, it not only tells you when you're dirty, it tells you how you can be clean again. The Bible tells you what is right. It tells you what is not right. It tells you how to get right. And then it tells you how to stay right. He says here that the Bible is profitable for instruction in righteousness. Now, that word for instruction usually applied to instructing a child. The Bible is like our parent. It instructs us. It tells us how we are to live our lives. Now, as parents, many of us want to make sure that our children know the Bible. They know the scriptures. So we, we send them to Sunday school. We send them to vacation Bible school. Some of you may, may spend a lot of money sending kids to Christian schools so that they can, they can learn the scriptures. They can learn what God says. But there are too many people who are believers in Jesus Christ as adults who would agree that their children need to learn the Bible but they themselves don't feel like they need it anymore. Well, I got saved years ago. I really don't need any more of this. I don't have to be in church. I don't have to read, read the Bible. I got saved. I got my fire insurance. That's all I'm interested in. Folks, let me tell you something. As an adult, you need the Bible more than a child does. Because I'll be honest with you, folks. As an adult, you face more temptations than children do. As an adult, you have more important decisions to make than children do. You need the, pi the Bible, if anything, more than a child does. Folks, uh, living our life is kind of like flying an airplane. I came across this illustration late, recently. I like this. It's like flying an airplane. If you're going to fly an airplane from Louisville to Los Angeles, you're going to need a flight plan. And you're going to need some instructions about how to fly that plane aren't you? Now, once you take off and you're, you're flying, you file a flight plan, the Bible is kind of like a flight plan for flying an airplane and instructions on how to fly it. Uh, think about it. You take off, you're flying towards Los Angeles. Everything's going fine. 
Then you start daydreaming, start thinking about uh, maybe what you're planning for Christmas, or uh, you start thinking about Kentucky basketball. You, you're daydreaming about something, you're not paying attention to what's going on, and all of a sudden the plane starts losing altitude. It gets lower and lower and lower, and all of a sudden you hear an alarm go off, and it says, danger, pull up, danger, pull up. Well, what's it doing? It's rebuking you, isn't it? Now, what happens if you ignore the rebuke? Well, you're going to crash. You're going to crash. I was reading a, a recently about a uh, Avianca uh, Airlines that uh, was flying from uh, Colombia, uh, South America, to Madrid, Spain, back in 1983. And they had made a mistake. You have to put in the altitude of the, uh, the altitude above sea level that the airport that you're landing at is, and that way your altimeter is correct. Well, they got the wrong altitude for Madrid. And so they're coming into Madrid, and it was foggy, and they couldn't see, and the visibility was limited. And uh, as they were flying into Madrid, all of a sudden, uh, the alarm started going off. Danger, danger, pull up, pull up, you're too low, pull up, pull up. And the pilot, who thought that this was just a malfunction, said, and I quote, shut up, gringo, and flipped off the, the, alarm, the alarm. 14 seconds later, he flew into the side of a mountain, killed 158 people. Why? He ignored the rebuke. He ignored the rebuke. Folks, the Bible will rebuke us. And if we ignore the rebuke of the scriptures, we will crash just like that airplane did. Think about all the crashes you've had in your life, morally, integrity, in, in your marriage, and relationships, the crashes you've had. I'd be, I'd, uh, be willing to, to uh, guess that most of the time, the crash, big crashes in our life come because we either did not consult the scriptures or we knew the scriptures and did not abide by them. We did not listen to the rebuke of God's word. Your life's just like an airplane. If you're going to fly that airplane in one of two ways, either you're going to fly it according to your feelings and your judgment, just like those Colombian airline pilots did, and crash, or you're going to rely on God's instrumentation and his warning, his directions, his rebukes. Here's something you need to remember. Your feelings will fail. Your judgment will be wrong. God's word never fails. It is never wrong. So many times the plane of our life crashes because we don't consult God's manual. God's manual. It's there for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness. The Bible is also a guide to where we eternally belong. Where we eternally belong. 2 Timothy verses, uh, three, uh, chapter 3, verse 17. That the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. And then chapter 4, verse 1. In charge, uh, I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his Kingdom. What's Paul saying here? He's saying that the Bible is God's final word on how you can spend eternity with the Lord. If you want to go to heaven, Paul says that this book is God's final word on how you get there. But a little warning. A little warning here. You won't go to heaven just by reading the Bible. You won't even go to heaven just by believing the Bible. See, the devil knows everything in the Bible. He believes every word of it. You go to heaven because you live the Bible, because you trust the Bible, because you have put your faith in what God has told you in the Bible. One of the greatest technological breakthroughs, uh, I, I think, in our lifetime has been uh, GPS, Global Positioning Satellites. I love GPS. I've, I've got it on my, on my phone, and every time I've got an address to go to and I've never been there before, I just put that thing in, and it guides me right to where I'm going. It's amazing. I love GPS. Uh, I believe that all technology is a gift from God, and 
And uh, this is, this is a, one of the, the, the greatest ones. I just love uh, the fact that it can, it can tell me where I am and where I need to get to. Here's the thing. God has given us the Bible as our spiritual GPS. And it can do a few things that satellites can't do for you. It can tell you that you're lost even before you know it. This word can tell you how to go from being lost to being in the place that you need to be. And it can guide you, not only in this world, but it can guide you into the next world as well. This is God's final word to us. He gave it to us because he loves us and he wants us to be with him forever. It really is his love letter to us. And it is one of the biggest gifts he has ever given. Maybe you're here this morning, you don't know Christ as your personal Savior. You, you've never put your trust, your faith in Jesus. Maybe you've even been a church member for years, but you've never put your faith in Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God, and the wages of sin is death, separation from God for eternity in a place called hell. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, who died on the cross to pay for the penalty for our sins. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. If we'll just put our faith in the fact that Christ died on the cross for us and believe that he died for us, and turn from our old way of living, turn from our sins, and live for Christ. The Bible says we can have heaven and eternal life. In just a moment, we're going to sing a hymn of invitation. I'm going to be down here at the front. I'm going to invite you to step into the aisle, come to the front and say, Pastor, I want to know this Jesus you've been talking about. I want to know that I have heaven and eternal life. But even more than that, I want a guide as to how I'm supposed to live my life. I don't want to crash and burn. I've done it one time too many already. I want to live according to the directions that God has given us. And I'll be here at the front. I'll talk to you. I'll pray with you and show you what your next step as a believer in Christ needs to be. Maybe you're here and you're a believer in Christ, but you really have not appreciated this gift enough. You haven't spent time enough in it. Folks, we're starting a new year. I can't think of a better time to commit yourself to getting back into the Word of God and spending time in it as a believer in Jesus Christ. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you love us and care about us and that you provided so many wonderful gifts for us. Especially at this Christmas season, we just celebrate those gifts. We celebrate the gift of the world and the life that you've given us to live in it. We celebrate the gift of your holy, inspired, and inerrant word. But Lord, we celebrate most of all Jesus Christ who came to die on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins, that we can have the gift of heaven and eternal life, forgiveness for our sins. There is now, therefore, no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Lord, we ask that you would move in our midst this morning. If there's any here that doesn't know Christ, that you would just convince them of their need for a Savior. And Heavenly Father, they would flee to you for salvation this morning in Christ's name. Amen.